History of the Sanctuary of Pompeii, Part 5. Chapter 4 The Second Renovation of the Picture of the Virgin. But in order to complete the history of the painting so venerated today, it is well that I should here bunch the events that occurred four years after that festal day. Commendatore Federico Maldarelli, a well-known Neapolitan painter, three and a half years later, that is to say in May 1879, seeing the daily increase in the ven veneration of so many Neapolitans and strangers, felt for the Virgin of Pompeii, moved by his great piety, offered to gratuitously and much more completely renovate the painting, which, because of the extreme dampness of the parish church, had almost completely deteriorated, and put a certain design of mine to effect, which was to have the St. Rose changed into St. Catherine of Siena. Both of these virgins of the Lord belong to my third order of penance, and in fact the two, former of the two, is the glory of the Americas, the first saint that the newly discovered and Christianized world gave to the church. But I prefer to behold kneeling near the Virgin of the Rosary in the new church by a special patroness, that angel of Fontebranda, that seraph of Siena, the first because an Italian in the glory of Italy and all Christianity, and secondly, because the mother and most especial mistress, mistress is of this same order. I therefore requested Maldorelli to please change the crown of roses of St. Rosa into a crown of thorns, the distinguishing sign of our Italian virgin, and also to have two wounds appear in the palm of her hands to recall her venerable stigmata. But there remained one arduous task, namely, that face like a full moon, which, if wholly unfitted for St. Rosa, was simply out of the question for the St. Catherine, woman of delicate constitution and gentle features, such as we see in the only portrait of her extant, painted by Vanni and preserved in the church of St. Dominic in Siena. The courteous Neapolitan artist promised to do his best to satisfy me. So the Countess di Fusco, on the following day, took the painting with her, in her carriage from Pompeii to Naples, and left it in the bookstore of Signor Salvatore Festa, asking him to see to it that the picture was conveyed to the celebrated painter's studio. But already in the course of these three years the Queen of the Rosary had shown signs of her approval and her pleasure in the growing work in this valley, and the erection of a temple sacred to her by many graces and prodigies. And many ladies and gentlemen had begun to undertake pilgrimages from Naples to this valley to thank the Blessed Mother for favors received or to ask for new ones. So did it not seem to just to me that the person should come to Pompeii to render thanks to the Most Holy Virgin and should find no image to venerate. Moreover, the, po the popular devotion which so often takes to a certain patron, to some special sculpture, to some particular color, dress, or form, beneath which it is wont to daily venerate the Madonna, ran the risk of cooling somewhat. What was to be done? The bounty of God, which gives rise to and then completes the good will of man, did not even fail me this time, and helped me to find an expedient in which its turn also produced other extraordinary events. 
My favorite resort in Naples at that time was the dear little church of the Rosary at Porta Medina. It was there that, together with my lamented friend and spiritual adviser, Father Redenti, and with Dr. Giuseppe Gaetani, we had, as far back as January 1874, gathered together as a society of ladies and gentlemen, all belonging to the Third Order, and every month we were wont to hold there our pious meetings, and it was because of the devotion of Dr. Gaetani and myself to St. Cecilia that the twenty-second day of every month was irrevocably fixed upon for the sacred conference. And the same custom still holds today in the church of San Domenico Maggiore, to which our tertiaries removed in 1885. The soul of this congregation of the Third Order in the Church of the Rosary at Porta Medina was that same tertiary who gave me the first picture of the Virgin, I mean, Sister Maria Concetti di Litala. To her, therefore, did I turn in my perplexity, and she told me that Father Redenti, at the same time that several years before in Via Anticagula, had brought, bought for three francs forty centimeters of the vo Virgin of the Rosary, had also purchased another painting of the same size by the same author, representing the nuptials of St. Catherine of Siena. Now it is well to know that that venerable man, because of his great love for the Rosary and his patroness, St. Catherine of Siena, though he was following an impulse of piety, when seeing the two objects of his heavenly love in the middle of a street f thrown down among old second-hand ware and wretched pictures, he bought them and carried them away, in order to remove from them such a humiliating position. And the sister, who will also owned this second picture given to her by the good father. Very well, said I. You gave me the first picture so as to plant the love for the rosary in the hearts of the peasants, and you will also give me the second, so that the devotion which has increased, not only in their hearts, but also in those of the Neapolitans, shall not suffer diminution. The sister, rejoiced to find herself an instrument in the hands of God, and thus enabled to benefit distant souls and to increase the devotion to the Rosary and to St. Catherine, immediately brought me down the painting, which, to tell the truth, was as old as the first, though not quite so hideous or woe-begone. It represented the Virgin of the rosary with a babe in her arms, in the act of giving the ring of the celestial nuptials to St. Catherine. St. Dominic, it is true, was missing, but there was a certain charm about the face of the Virgin, and the saint of Siena was not as repellent as the St. Rose in the other painting, so it appeared to me to have gained something. The peasants, thought I, will not mind the substitution. After all, it is the Virgin of the Rosary I am presenting to their veneration. But a black, discouraging doubt arose in my mind. Will the favors continue to flow down from heaven when I shall have changed the image? Oh, without a doubt, answered I to myself. It is not the image that works miracles in Pompeii, but it is the power of God clearly manifesting itself there, because he alone can do great and admirable things. Qui facit mirabilia magna solus. The image is but the simple instrument of his prodigies, but God desires, and today more than ever, that the most perfect creature ever formed by his hands 
the Divine Mother of Jesus, should be honored in this world, and he wants her honored and venerated by all peoples with one accent. Ave, and with that same hymn, the Rosary. It is therefore the Rosary which draws such copious benedictions from heaven. It is the Church of the Rosary the Virgin wishes to see built in Pompeii as she shows by her miracles. I was not mistaken. My new undertaking of thus changing or rather contrasting with the habits of the people was crowned with success. The second picture placed in the same spot whence the first one had been removed, received the same veneration, and new and miraculous graces poured down from heaven on many of those, many who associated themselves to the new work, or who came here to explore new favors. The heavenly virgin deigned to prove to me by facts that she showered her blessings on this abandoned land for the predilection she bears her celestial rosary, and more especially for the love she felt for the temple, which was to rise in honor of her rosary on this pagan land of Pompeii. And even if this image were removed, the wonders of the Lord would still be the same. Among the favors obtained while the second picture of St. Catherine and the Virgin of the Rosary was in veneration, it will suffice for me to recall one which the reader already finds published and documented in the pamphlet Novena to the Most Blessed Virgin of the Rosary of Pompeii. Also in the third year, page 34 of the monthly publication, The Rosary and the New Pompeii. I mean the blessing granted to myself in person, went on bringing this picture of the nuptials of St. Catherine to my room, the Blessed Virgin restored me to life, and this took place in the evening of the 18th of August, 1879. Whosoever should desire today to see this second picture will find it at the extreme end of the first dormitory of the orphan girls. I wished that the saint of the Benincasa family the admirable teacher of all virtues who obtained for me from Mary the grace of my temporal life, should be a safe and sure guide to heaven to all these poor or orphans gathered together here one by one and entrusted to her. I thought no better place could be found for the painting, which was the means of the saving of my life, that here in the midst of lonely innocence that it composes the real crown of lilies and roses of the Queen of Victories of Pompeii. Maldorelli kept the miraculous image, today properly known as the Virgin of, Virgin of Pompeii, in his studio from June until August, 1879. He spared no pains to really make a devotional picture of it. He found the means of decreasing the size of the Virgin's head and giving a certain air of refine refinement to the enormous face of St. Rose, at the same time thinning it down as much as possible. He also gave a gentler expression to the rough features of St. Dominic, and to the babe he, he lent an air of vivacity, which it to this day preserves. But the trouble was, as he had already, has already been said, that the canvas was ruined. In order to renew it, Commodore Maldorelli had recourse to one of the great artists in that time in Naples, Signor Francesco Chiorelli. Chiarillo, who then had and still has his studio in the Luperano Palace, Salita Museo. I remember paid Signor Chiarillo sixty francs for the canvas alone. Here, with exquisite art, according to modern discoveries, withdrew from the painting 
the old and torn canvas and substituted a new and much higher one, which in fact enabled Commodore Maldarelli to add another palm of painting above the virgin heads, a space that was wholly lacking in the first picture. And this he did with such a perfect imitation of antique tints that to make the whole appear at a distance, the work of the same epoch and even the author. And so the painting have been retouched for the first time by the artist Galella in 1876, repainted by the celebrated Commodore Maldarelli in 1879, the face of the Virgin wholly altered, St. Rose changed into St. Catherine of Siena, even the old canvas removed and a new one substituted, the head of the Virgin and that of the child crowned with a diadem of diamonds, her neck encircled with a necklace of precious gems. It will be seen that scarcely a trace of the old picture remains. Thus exposed, surrounded by a frame of molded bronze, that has cost ten thousand francs, with fifteen bronze medallions encasing the fifteen mysteries of the rosary, painted by Paliote, forming a crown around it, the painting has acquired such an artistic appearance that the lovely face of the Virgin appears indeed to be to like to gently trembling morning star. However, we still keep with the greatest pleasure the first pictures reproduced from their first homely painting. A fortunate artist whom we first called to Pompeii was old Dolfino of Naples, who worked for the booksellers in the Via St. Biagio di Labrai and was recommended to us by our friend, Signor Salvatore Festa, the editor. Yet in those first reproductions and lithographic engravings, which today seem so hideous, were yet the objects of the greatest veneration, and we ourselves had seen them elegantly framed in gold and silver and venerated in the houses of noble families, more especially in the homes of those who were first to receive us when we went around in Naples singing, seeking to find subscribers for a penny a month. But even after the second renovation, the image was not yet in a condition to be photographed, and we still preserve, as a historical document, the first photographs taken which suited no one in the world. To be historically sincere and truthful we cannot attribute to the painter Maldarelli, nor yet would he attribute it to himself, a certain celestial expression on the Virgin's face which all who today come to the sanctuary notice and which s inspires confidence, love, and devotion at the same time. It is at the same time a ray of beauty and gentleness and of majesty that shines down from those eyes, making all who approach the sanctuary with life bend the knee before that old canvas while their heart beats with rapture. I am personally convinced that the Virgin, by a visible portent, has embellished her own face. And as Many of us, as are here, concur in declaring that from the very day this painting was removed from the old and tumbled-down parish of the Most Holy Saviour, and placed in the new chapel which forms a part of the great sanctuary on the left, a certain beauty, a majesty, and confidence inspiring sweetness, are to be noticed on the features of the celestial queen, which most certainly were not to be seen before. And if persons prefer to believe what may be also the case, as the Virgin has no need of miracles, and that this, our manner of seeing, arises from the disposition of our hearts, this fact will still remain incontrovertible and out of doubt, as shown by daily proofs, 
namely that person of all nationalities who come here every day, behold in that image something which attracts and constrains admiration, not because of any artistic perfection, as this is certainly not a Madonna painted by Raphael, but some secret latent power, which draws one, almost against one's will, to kneel and pray. Oh yes, while praying before that image, one feels in one's soul the firm hope that prayer will be answered, and such ineffable bliss is enjoyed as who has never felt cannot possibly understand. This is the history of the miraculous effigy, which is venerated in the valley of Pompeii, center of the sighs, prayers, wishes, and supplications of thousands of Catholics, who turn to our blessed Queen with perfect confidence from every part of it, Italy, Europe, and the world. Chapter 5 the first miracle. Well, during the first half of the month of February 1875, we were busy founding in v Valle de Pompeii the Society of the Most Holy Rosary and building a temporary altar to the Virgin in order that the faithful might enjoy all the annexed indulgences. Such an extraordinary event had taken place in Naples that, far from its very singular in the course of a few days, it was in the mouths of many, and even re reached the ears of his eminence, the cardinal, who was then Sisto Riario Forza. The rapid divulgation of this event also caused the news that near the ruins of Pompeii a church was going to be rebuilt to the real God, to circulate rapidly and find for its reception a large opening. The event was really of such a nature as to be surprising. In fact, it was a miracle, and the precise spot where it was said to have taken place was the house number 62 in Via Tribunale. But the strangest part of it was that this certain something supernatural had taken place in that house from the day and a certain promise that had been made to help in the building of some churches, which perhaps would be erected in Pompeii after who knows how many years. Those who bore witness to the fact were not only a most distinguished family of Naples, the Lucarelli, but also many other dwellers in the same house, especially Madame Anna Maria Lucarelli, today passed to a better life, a woman of remarkable virtues, a person of letters and an artist, a model for all Christian souls. This strange event, which we are about to relate, was the first evident sign from heaven, which at an early period proved to all the Neapolitans the favor with which the celestial virgin looked upon the building of a church sacred to her on the ground so long held in bondage by Satan. It was the first grace which the virgin granted to the lovers of her future temple. In relating the fact to our readers, we will not depart by one word from the written statement made out by Madame Anna Maria Lucarelli, and announced from all the pulpits of that immense town. Clorinda Lucarelli of Naples, a lovely child of twelve years of age, but an orphan having lost both her parents, had since the month of August 1874 been frightfully tormented with, the hor with horrible epileptic convulsions. Despite all the remedies of the medicinal art, which were ceaselessly applied, 
the disease progressed in such a manner as to cause the greatest sorrow and affliction to all the household. Her loving aunt, Madame Anna Marie Lucarelli, who had who took the place of a tender mother to the poor unfortunate child, wished to consult another of the most illustrious professors of Naples, the celebrated commendator Antonio Cardarelli. He agreed with the opinion of the other renowned physicians, namely, that the convulsions were of an epileptic nature. Nevertheless, he prescribed a line of treatment, but with regret pronounced the hard sentence, that he could give no sh sure hope of recovery. The poor girl, at this sad announcement, became silent, grows pale, and resignedly bows her head. But on the first day of May, 1875, the girl's aunt wished to take the child to the church of St. Nicholas Tolentino, where miraculous where the miraculous image of the Immaculate Conception of Lourdes is venerated, hoping that the Mother of God would save her poor niece from the insidious disease which she was afflicted. She had her drink some of the miraculous water, had her inscribed in the registers of the pious mount of the Virgin, Blessed Virgin, and prayed long and earnestly for the child's recovery after which she returned home, her heart full of faith and hope. But God, for all his high ends, thought fit to choose another time and another occasion to show the intercessory power of his mother. Clorinda Duke grew, grew worse and worse. The convulsions attacked her with greater frequency and intensity, till at last they followed each other every three or four days, and not unfrequently daily and at various intervals. Then the change of air was tried, but nevertheless, despite the wholesome country air and the medicines constantly used, she remained as she was for six months without the slightest change for the better. In fact, the girl, worn out by fruitless use of all medicinal remedies, without the knowledge of anyone gave up every sort of treatment towards the end of November, 1875. Her loving aunt, tired and worn out and fatigued by hopes deferred, after this suffering of so many woes, at last formed the historic, heroic, resolve of sending the beloved little invalid under the care of a daughter of charity to France to bathe in the prodigious waters of the sanctuary of Lourdes, thus hoping to see her return cured. But how send away a child that required unceasing care and attention? For now the dreadful evil attacked the girl not only by day but also by night, and often she would fall to the ground with great force, often bleeding, and always frothing and writhing her delicate little body, with constant danger to her life. It was on the day of the Feast of the Purification of 1876. In the afternoon Clorinda suddenly escaped the vigil eye of her aunt, who, almost with a presentiment of some greater ill, went in search of her in fear and trembling. But she found her, horrible to think, near the well, with her head inside the bucket, having perhaps felt a desire to drink, and in that position taken an almost violent attack of convulsions, thus running the risk of suffocating herself, and what is more, precipitating, into the well. The following day, the 3rd of February, the poor child was tormented as she had never been before. From morning till evening the convulsions were so violent and so frequent that they rendered her almost insensible and wholly incapable of even recognizing the members of her family. Her poor aunt was in a state of dejection 
impossible to describe, when on that same day, 3rd of February, Countess de Fusco entered the house, and during the course of conversation happened to mention the fact that the new church was to be built in Valley de Pompeii, dedicated to the Virgin of the Rosary. At the same time she informed her of certain singular events which the Lord had marked the beginning of his new undertaking. She told her how in a few days a brotherhood of the Rosary would be founded in Pompeii, and how an image of the Virgin of the Rosary would for the first time be exposed on an altar to attract the poor peasants, and instill in their hearts the love for the celestial beads. She also explained to her how forlorn was the condition of these four toilers of the land, and how great was their ignorance. When the afflicted lady heard this tale, she felt newborn hope arise in her heart, and she made a secret promise to help in the work, with all her power, if only her niece should be cured. What increased her hope, too, was the fact that not only she herself, but also her niece, had for several months been aggregated to the Third Order of St. Dominic's, and were, for that reason, beloved daughters of the Virgin of the Rosary. Mrs. Anna Maria Lucarelli, moved by a faith and a hope she had not felt for a long time, subscribed her name, exclaiming, Countess, if the Virgin of the Rosary, for whom I feel an immense devotion, will grant me the grace of the recovery of this my niece, I will here be at your service. I will myself to make a tour of the houses in Naples, seeking offerings for the Church of Pompeii. Here is my offering, not of a cent a month, but of ten cents a month and I pay down a whole year's amount as a pledge of the offering. I will make it, I will make if my prayer is granted. And the Queen of the Heavenly Roses, who saw that the time was ripe for a new manifestation of her power, to be shown to the perishing world, or, perhaps, like at the marriage feast in Canaan, by means of her powerful prayers obtained from her the son the anticipation of the hour of her prodigies in the land of dead pagans, looked down from heaven upon that pious woman with the eyes of a mother, and wonderful to relate from day on which her, her image was exposed to the Pompeian people from that memorial day of the 13th of February, when the confraternity of the Rosary was erected in Pompeii, and from that day, I say, Clorinda was restored to complete faith. Two famous professors, and Messieurs Marzio Castronuevo and Salvador Farina, who had attended Clorina, Clorinda, were not at all reluctant to certify, certify to the serious state of the young girl, to the perfect in unity of all the medications used and the rapid unhoped for transition from the most ser serious illness to complete recovery. Which recovery, not being based on any of the remedies recommended by science, and indeed in direct contradiction with all the opinions of science itself, but force the minds of the doctors by strength of a logical deduction to admit the intervention had some supernatural power. Nothing more was required of them, and this was obtained as can clearly be seen from the following certificates. 1. Blank. I. The undersign. Doctor in medicine and surgery, do hereby certify that Miss Clorinda Lucarelli, as far back as the month of August 1874, she began to suffer from undoubted paroxysms of central epilepsy, 
which repeated themselves at longer or shorter intervals up to the third day of February in the year 1874, from which day up to the date here below affixed, they can have no longer manifested themselves. I cannot omit to state that the diagnosis I made of the malady was completely ratified in a consultation held between myself and Professor Commendatore Antonio Di Martino, and confirmed by per Professor Cardarelli, and we all three decided upon and prescribed the most energetic, curative, pharmaceutic, and hygienic treatment, such as country air, chosen food, etc. But despite all these powerful medicinal remedies, the above-mentioned epileptic paroxysms uh, continued to be frequent and intense. During all the above-stated period, and more especially during the latter months of their violence was extreme, I signed this document in honor of truth. May, Naples, May 18th, 1876. Signed, Marzio Castro Nuovo. Two, I, the undersigned, attendant professor on Miss Clorinda Lucarelli, daughter of Professor Dominic Lucarelli, deceased, and of about the age of twelve, do hereby certify that said Miss had for several years been afflicted with epileptic convulsions, which could be attributed to no assignable cause, in which, despite the most varied treatment, continued to torment her at various times, by night as well as by day, till about four months ago, when, suddenly, without the use of any human remedies, she passed from a state of extreme illness to a state of perfect health, which she is still enjoying to the surprise of all. To this I certify on my honor and conscience, ready to confirm it with my oath. Naples, June 4th, 1876. Professor Salvatore Farina. Chapter 6. The Neapolitan Nobility. At that time it happened that the Countess met in the streets of Naples Mrs. Lucarelli, who was accompanied by her two nieces, Laura and Clorinda, the latter in the best of health. No sooner did my aunt see my wife than, with tears and joy in her eyes, she told the Countess about the unexpected miracle, and, Here I am she added, inebriated with joy. For two years I have made the round of all the churches in Maples, soliciting public prayers for the recovery of my dear Clorinda. Now I will return to all these churches to have public thanksgiving rendered to the Lord for this most special grace, and to have it attributed to the intercession of the Virgin of the Rosary, who desires a church in Pompeii. At this very moment I am going to tell what had happened to His Eminence the Cardinal Riario, who, to whom I have so often turned in my distress, acquainting him with my sorrow. What our joy was on hearing this news from the Countess upon her return home, the reader can readily imagine. But when the first impulse of joy had subsided, and we began seriously to think the matter over, the reflection produced such a strong impression on us as to quite astound us. But is it possible? The Madonna thus bless a work so poorly and meanly begun, and then perform a miracle? And why? For the rustic church of poor peasants? It would therefore seem that she appreciates our good will. If this is so, everything will proceed well. 
Perhaps the Madonna wishes us to begin the church immediately. Then we will begin it. All these considerations, while on the one hand they showed it, they shed a ray of comfort on our spirit, and on the other hand somewhat agitated us, as having the desire to do a great deal at one time we do not know on what first to lay our hand so to, as to proceed quickly. There is, thought we, but one safe and sure way, if only the aristocracy of Naples, which is wealthy and pious, would take a hand and an interest in the new work, oh, then indeed it would go along on wheels. But how to enter those homes where only titled people enter, or titled relatives, or titled strangers, introduced by other titled persons? It was true that we already had among our subscribers the ladies Fonton, the noble and pious Duchess of Casamassima, the Duchess of Messalania, the Lady Frances de Domenicis, and the friend of Miss, Mrs. Urbicella, the Duchess of Montagnareal, Miss Raffaella Piria, the Duchess of Capricotta, and others belonging to the pious union of Catherine Volpicelli. But then the aristocracy of Naples is so very numerous. Nevertheless, strengthened by that inner force which proceeds from the faith and the trust of the supernatural, we began to make the rounds of the streets of Naples, in order to find subscribers for a cent a month, to take part in the work which heaven already with open miracles showed to appreciate. The pious Duchess Morelli was just returning from the meeting of Catherine Volpicelli. The Countess, no sooner did she see her than she begged her to become a promulgator of the new work, and also solicited her in indicate to us powerful families to whom to turn for the prescript subscription of a cent a month. Do you wish to have numerous and good addresses of wealthy and noble me Neapolitan families? Answered the Duchess Morelli. Then turn to the Marchioness Felace di Soma, whom you already knew. It is her mother, the Princess del Colli. Had, had spread through the Na Naples with the devotion of fifteen Saturdays of the Rosary. The Mar Marchioness is a saintly woman, wealthy, connected with the finest families in Naples, and what is more, given to building churches. I really could indicate to you no other person who would be as good a guardian angel and guide. This advice appeared to us to be like the ray of sunlight that scatters the clouds. Without losing time, we directed our steps tor towards the palace of Marchionis Filiasi. It is sweet to remember, after a lapse of nineteen years, the conversation which took place that day, and whence sprung the fact, that foremost among the social classes, the aristocracy of Naples became the first pillar of origin, and support of the great work God wished begun in Pompeii. The noble lady received us with a kind and benevolent familiarity, as though she had known us for a long time. But when she heard our project, she was frank in expressing her opinion. You have, said she, undertaken a most difficult task. There are so many charities in Naples, and such beautiful charities that are still barely able to support themselves because they are all upheld by the same persons. Now how do you wish to add another one to the numberless ones already existing, and especially the building of a church? In a desert country, 
far from Naples, in fact outside the diocese of Naples, I must honestly tell you that you will find it hard to succeed. I, a after spending more than 50,000 francs towards the erection of a church in Foggia, had seen the whole thing left in suspense. Moreover, I know the nature of Southerners. They undertake new works with great fervor, fervor, and then they tire because of the multiplicity of the same, and because new ones arise to call their attention. Marcionis, answered we, we have already presented all the difficulties to our holy bishop of Nola, but you do know th that he answered, you are egotists, you are only thinking of yourselves in your own time. Churches are not built in one generation. St. Peter's in Rome and St. Peter's in Petersburg were only completed after three centuries. You have the merit of beginning. Others, after fifty years, will have the merit of finishing. The Marchionis, who was truly good, shrugged her shoulders and added, To satisfy you, and so as to have a little merit myself, I subscribe my name. But with only a cent a month you will do nothing. Ladies at least should subscribe for fifty centums, ten cents a month, and I, to set the example, shall subscribe for half a franc every month. After which the Marchionis had her daughter-in-law and her son, the Marquis Luigi Filiasi, subscribe, and also her German governess and other members of her family. Before leaving, she turned to us, saying, However, let me give you one piece of advice. Call in no architect for this work, which only counts on penny subscriptions, and will last dear knows how many years. Otherwise, the architect's fee alone will absorb half your capital. I know this by experience. After having spent many thousand francs on the church and convent of Fra Ludi Ludovico of Caesoria and Tondo of Capodimonte in Naples, all work now has been suspended. But what is worse, poor Father Ludovico is in litigation with the architect because this latter wishes to exact his fee. My dear Marcionis, said I, smiling, and who could think of calling an architect? Moreover, being a church for peasants to be built on a desert land, there will be no need of architects. We will do all things ourselves. I have already thought of what I shall do. I shall go with my mason to some town near and look at some church. We will take the necessary measurements with some twine, and then we will lay the foundations. When I ceased speaking, she gave us a quantity of her visiting cards, telling us at the same time the names and addresses of many of her relatives and friends to whom to present them in her name. And she had her own butler accompany us to the house of the Count of Gigliano and to the residence of the Marchioness of Rende, the Duke of Bivonia, the Princess of Torella, the Duchess of Salve, the Princess of Giraci, the Princess of Angri, where we named Miss Josephine Ana Anastasio, promoter of the Duchess of Ebolai, of Duchess of Gallo, the Marchioness Ruffo, the Mar Marchioness Ca Calenda, uh, Marchionis of, Gu of Guida Mandri and others. And so through these noble ladies we were introduced to the family of note, as though the excellent Duke of Capricata, between whom and ourselves there existed a brotherly friendship, we had good fortune to become acquainted with such pious distinguished persons as the Duke of Paganiccia, 
and the Count de la Tour, the Duchess of Mayo, the Duchess of Tora, the Marchioness of Latiano Mayo, the Marchioness Piscicelli, the Duke of San Vito, the Marchioness of Salandra, the Countess of Balsorano, the Marchioness of De la Valva, whose niece, Miss Maria D'Alia, is to this day fulfilling the sweet duties of promoter of the Madonna of Pompeii. At the same time, we were so very fortunate as, as to interest in the incipient church of Pompeii through ways which providential the Duchess of Laurentisa, the Countess Gaetani di Lorenzana, the Marchioness Bonelli, the Marchioness of St. Eramo, the Princess Pignoni del Caretto, and that English gentle lady, Miss Macleod, the instructress of Miss Amelia Colonna, the daughter of the Prince of Colonna, of Stigliano, who now is among the most fervent promoters of the sanctuary of Pompeii. This is how, most certainly by divine will and counsel, the Neapolitan aristocracy was elected by the Queen of Heaven to take a prominent part in the first beginnings of the sanctuary of Pompeii. But it is not for us to scrutinize the ways of providence, but one fact impresses itself most forcibly on our minds, now that nineteen years have passed, a fact that constitutes a distinguishing feature of this sanctuary. It may perhaps be owing to this divine inter uh, disposition that ever since the annual festivals in the Valley of Pompeii began, a certain solemn and noble, noble gravity, such as is fitted to divine worship, has always been observed. Even on the occasion of the greatest solemnaries, as the, as the populace of Naples, good and full of heart and generosity though it is, yet still, by nature, noisy and fun-loving, did not take part in them, so that the religious demeanor, so contrary to all noise and clamorous feasts, has become, by force of example, the habit and custom of this and the neighboring people. Hence it arises that despite the immense crowd of people, there is always a profound and religious silence reigning in the sanctuary, the silence of adoration and of heartfelt prayer. <laughs> 